Hi guys, um, I bought this game Colonial recently and I really like it and unfortunately the two or three videos that are on Board Game Geek relate to the first edition and the game has changed quite substantially since then so I thought I'd do a, a sort of uh, explanation of how it works it's a wonderful game, well, what I really like about it is the rules are quite simple as you'll see it's very open-ended and lots and lots of player interaction for a Euro so um, really fun game anyway, um, I'll quickly talk to you about the, about the rules um, the theme is obviously colonialism, so what we are is each player plays a powerful European country. Um, the basic game, you just uh, differentiate it by color, um, but there is an advanced game where you have a specific country uh, marker on it. I put the country markers on, but the game, I, I won't talk about those rules at all, I'll just talk about the general rules. So basically what you do is, <clears throat> you're a powerful European country, you go and discover distant parts of the world, and exploit the people and the resources. Um, it's a really cynical game in that, in that sense, but probably uh, accurate. Um, okay, so first up, just a little bit of uh, discussion on the components, which are beautiful, by the way. Um, the board is divided into specific areas, and each area, um, except for these three up here in North Africa and uh, the Middle East, uh, is not discovered yet, so it's got a prestige token, which is the victory points in this game, on it. Um, it also has little uh, round bits which show what resource comes from that place. And um, so what you will do is you'll discover the place, you'll put your marker on uh, to say that you have now claimed that resource, you'll take that. Um, and then we can do all kinds of interesting things like um, turn it into a colony, which means you can put a flag there, I'll talk about that later. You can also um, create unrest, you can send missionaries to quell the unrest, which is a really nice little touch in the game, is that you, uh, the missionaries actually quell unrest and appease the natives. Um, and you can create war, uh, have make war on each other, you can trade, um, all kinds of interesting things which I'll get to in a minute. Um, okay, so basically, oh, the other thing about the board is it's in each corner of the board there's a, a, a sort of a track, and these are like power-ups in a video game, you, you pay to go up on the track and that gives you more power in future to do things more easily in the game. The track up here is the economy track. That's the sort of only um, one with a bit of a quirk to it because only when you get to economy six, which is the third space on the track, are you allowed to claim the resources of tea and poppies here in, in China and in um, India. And if you get to economy ten, slavery is outlawed and anybody uh, shipping slaves at those stages are penalized. Um, there's this bit, which is seafaring, which helps you to discover new lands. The one down there is navies. It helps you to build new navies. And logistics help you to set, settle areas more quickly. In many ways, the most interesting track on the board is the diplomacy track. Um, it's not per a perfect name for it, but it basically measures how good a country, how moral you've been. And a lot of things you do will cause you to slide down on this track and get worse and worse towards the black, the blackbird. Um, and those are things like massacre, massacring the natives, which is part of this game, um, or, or declaring war on people or cause you to slide down. The interesting or the sort of game effect of it is that whenever you declare war, you can only declare war on people who are on the same level as you or lower. So if we were like that, um, these two guys can declare war on each other and on to everybody else. But these guys cannot declare war on anybody who's higher than them. And that becomes quite important in the game. Um, the other thing that's, that was actually left off the original board is this little very important thing called the Monopoly Ownership Chart. Because when you claim a resource like that, um, and if you are the only person with that type of resource, you get the monopoly for it. You don't have to control all of them like, like I've claimed slavery there. There's actually three slavery sources, resources, but as long as nobody else has any of the others, I have the slavery um, monopoly. Monopoly is slightly... Um, got a slight quirk to it in that the pictures of the products um, are in a way immaterial in the game. It's really the color that matters. You see all these orange uh, resources, I think there are about 11 of them, so very hard to have the orange uh, monopoly for long. Um, you only look at the color. So for all the resources it's only the color that matters and then the three golds which are here and over there, they count as a monopoly each. And monopolies um, determine player order and it also allows you some special benefits in the game. So Monopoly is a really an important part of the game. Okay, um, back to how the, um, the game actually plays out. 
the game has five phases and um, the last four of them are basically housekeeping so I'm probably going to talk about them first I think let me just have a quick look yeah so you play your normal phase one which is called the endeavor phase and which is basically the entire game after that you have a phase where you can turn your treasury I haven't spoken about this little thing here and it's got um, an area for your treasury it's got where you this area where you collect your victory points or mark your victory points then it's got uh, merchant fleets at the top and naval navies at the bottom um, they are uh, yep yeah, anyway you sort of that's where you keep track of where you are in the game okay so what you do in that that uh, housekeeping phase is for every monopoly you own on this board you're allowed to move one treasury into the merchant fleets and for every place you have on the naval um, track which is on that far bottom right hand corner you can remove one treasury into your naval fleet um, we look at who's got the most monopolies and that player becomes the first player and player order is important in this game um, if if there's no clear leader in monopoly the play or first player just passes on to the left um, what is the other thing oh if you've got loans because you can take out loans in this game the loans will be marked here so if that's the loan area and loans attract interest, so what you do is you add another one at the end of every game turn, you add one more to your loan. And I'll talk about how you pay off and get rid of your loans later. I think that's it for, for the in-between phase. Um, yeah, okay. But that first phase, which is the entire game basically, um, called the Endeavor phase, and that you play with these cards. And every player has a set of six identical cards, and each card has two rolls on it. Um, and you can only do one of the two roles. So what we do is you select, all players simultaneously select the five cards they're going to play. One card you just won't play, so if for instance that card I won't play, and I decide which five I want to play, I put them face down in order that I want to play them. Open my space here. And we all do this. And everybody has an identical deck of cards, um, of different colors but they're all identical when we've all done this so we've selected what we we're going to do we all simultaneously flip over our first card and then you do one of the two actions on the card and then we all flip over the second card and we do one of the two actions now obviously if you flip the card and you were intending to do say for instance this was the the card I was intending to do scientist but by the time it gets to my turn I decided to rather do missionary no one will even know um, so that doesn't matter if you don't want to do either of them, you can just pass and miss that opportunity to do something. Um, there are some player aids on, on the Geek which are um, very useful. Um, none of them did quite what I wanted to do, so I made one myself. And what I've done is I've put each card on its own column. And I've put the actions at the top, because I think people probably think in terms of I want to start a colony rather than I want to play the Conqueror, you know, which is the same thing. But anyway, so for each of them, um, for each card, there are these two options on the card and you can do one of them. On this player aid, I've sort of organized them in a reasonably logical fashion. I mean, playing the top row there would not be the worst move that one can make. Um, so you can download this from, from the Geek, but um, I'm just going to talk about each of the roles in turn because, you know, that, those are the things you need to know to be able to play the game. The first card um, that I'm going to talk about is the Scientist. The scientist very simply lets you allows you to move one up on each sorry one up on one of the four tracks on the board, and what you do is you pay from your treasury the amount printed in the next place. So mostly it's going to be one, two, or in this case in the economy four. So if I wanted to move up in economy, I would pay four treasury. They go off to the the pool of tokens that you've got on the side, and I'd move up one on the economy track which will you know, give me special abilities. The second one to talk about is the Explorer, and that's one that people will use a lot. The Explorer allows you to discover new parts of the world. And simply what you do is if you play the Explorer, you'll go, okay, West Africa, for instance. Um, and West Africa, like all regions, has a number printed on it, which is the difficulty number. In West Africa's case, it's number three. Most places is about a s four, I would think. Um, and these top places that are already discovered don't have numbers because you cannot discover them. 
So to discover West Africa, I have to get my dice. And these dice have two sides with little um, laurel wreaths on them for success and everything else is black. You roll your 10 dice and see if you've rolled three. If you've rolled three, you're successful. Um, you can uh, modify that number by your seafaring, uh, which we all start with zero, but you can go up to three. So you can modify that number. Also, if you're already adjacent to an area, say for instance, I was already in Angola, I would have to only roll uh, two. So that's another modification. Although it's not cumulative. If I was adjacent on two sides, I wouldn't get an extra benefit. It's just the one always. So that's what you do. And if you're successful, you get the victory point. It goes on your victory point uh, on your player track. And then you have a choice. You can either play a one of your merchant ships onto that area and start a trading post on either of the two um, resources if there's more than one. Or, so you place it and now I've claimed that and as I've said earlier now if I did that I would be the only person with uh, slaves and I would also claim the monopoly on slaves. Um, you can do it another way which is you don't use your fleet but you use treasury which is sort of easier to come by so it's um, slightly easier to use treasury rather but if you do that immediately the natives get upset and there is an unrest in the area by the way there are two un different unrest tokens um, but they functionally absolutely identical so that's the way to do that there are some um, anomalies around uh, exploration for instance the americas probably the most important one they do the cost to explore them is actually too higher than the printed number until the first one is found and when the first one is found um, you then get that off. Uh, when the first one is found they all revert to the printed numbers and the first person to discover something in america gets a bonus uh, bonus prestige point um, and also what would happen is somebody would get this and the other prestige point that is saved here will then go to circumnavigation which is some, a further option with with your exploration you can pay one treasury when you're exploring, roll another a bunch of dice, 10 of them. If you get a six, you can circumnavigate the world and you get another prestige point. Um, if you discover, uh, if you explore India or China, you go up one on the, the uh, diplomacy track. I have to say, I don't quite see the thematic uh, reason for that, but be that as it may. Australia is quite difficult. It's got a seven to explore, which is quite high, but you actually have to explore it successfully twice before you can actually claim the resources. Um, bit of a special rule there, which I won't go into now. I mean, these special rules are few and far between, and when you get to them, you know, just pop up in the rule book. Um, the rule book is actually extremely well done, and also a thing of beauty with lots of sort of um, historical looking etches and things in the corners. It's really a really fantastic rule book. In fact, everything about this game strikes me as being pretty damn good. Um, so that was the Explorer character. Which character shall I look at now? The Viceroy. Where's the Viceroy? Ah, the Viceroy character lets you put extra people into the, an already explored area. Say, for instance, um, I have already explored that area. And blue let's say blue is the other player it plays the viceroy that allows him to put men into that area and he can do so to the level of his logistics which is the track in the bottom left hand corner we all start on one so he could claim that resource and immediately also claim that uh, monopoly in the game whenever you break somebody's monopoly so let's just assume that angola was already explored and he goes into angola now suddenly he's into slaves as well my slave monopoly is broken and when you break somebody's monopoly you s immediately penalized and you slide down one on the diplomacy scale um, the other thing you can do with the viceroy say for instance you had a level of two on no let's just do this again on a level of one he could play on top of me and it doesn't change anything the bottom guy controls the resource however if he had um, logistics two and he could play two of them he would immediately slide down to the bottom and he would claim that uh, that resource. When you claim somebody else's resource like that, that causes you to slide down on the diplomacy scale another, you know, one more. 
The only difference is these are not cumulative. If you would, if you claim somebody else's resource and at the same time break a monopoly, um, you don't go down twice. You just go down once. That I think is everything about the explorer character. Let's look at what else is there. The conqueror. The conqueror is one one of the three characters in the game that actually give you a. Um, where's the conqueror? Ah, here it is. The conqueror it gives you a victory point. You get a victory point when you explore an area. The Conqueror lets you make a colony, and a colony gives you another victory point. Say, for instance, the blue guy played the Conqueror, and he already had three people in that area. Just, just assume it. The number of the local population, which is uh, reflected in a number of little silhouetted figures, some of them are more visible than others, so a couple where you really have to look well to see them, um, West Africa has three, so the native power in West Africa is three. If you have, if you control all the resources in an area and your number of settlers or forces, whoever these people uh, represent, are at least equal to the native power, you can then call, you know, turn something into a colony. You put your flag into it. You collect another victory point for it. Um, and once it's a colony, other people cannot do um, what the blue player did in this example. You cannot go into somebody else's colony. So the moment the blue player makes that a colony, no other player can put new people into it. Um, when you've created a colony, you have a number of options, and some of them are pretty nasty that you can do. You can take one of your tokens off the area into your merchant fleet straight away. Um, you can pillage the area, which means you get... Uh, you get tokens, the tokens there, you can turn them into a lie. You can get, equal to the native power, you can get a number of, of extra treasury into your resource. If it is a place with gold, you can actually get double the native power into your, into your uh, treasury. But if you do that, um, the natives get a bit upset with you and you have unrest. But the next thing you can do is you can massacre people. Um, when you know some people balk a bit at this in the first play, but um, it's probably historically sound and um, and you know in terms of the game, it's not the unwisest thing to do. Is you massacre the natives, um, which removes the unrest. Okay, so when you massacre the natives, um, you are penalised in your, on the diplomacy track. You become a less uh, moral country and easier for others to attack. So. Um, there's also another possibility with the um, colonization, which is all about uh, the beige colonies, which are here in um, New France, the West Indies, and Brazil. If you have any of those and you also have slavery, there's uh, you can actually take somebody else's merchant ship and get him to work for you um, to symbolize the triangular trade that was uh, very lucrative in those days. So that was the conqueror. The merchant... The merchant lets you ship goods to market, and you can ship as many goods as you have merchant fleets. So red has two merchant, no, let's, let's just do it with blue. Uh, blue has two merchant fleets that you start the game with. They've got two resources, so they can ship two resources from those two, two um, settlements of theirs into the market, and you just take two extra ones, plonk them into market. If you had, um, say for instance, uh, blue had three merchant ships, he could then ship somebody else's uh, goods. So if, if Red had Angola, um, Blue can then say, listen, can I ship from you your place as well? Um, there's almost no reason to refuse it when somebody asks to ship your things, except if you think he's going to win any moment, you might not want to do it. But otherwise, let him ship it. So what happens in that case is Red gets paid immediately for his goods that are shipped, he simply adds another token to his treasury, and um, blue has an extra uh, resource which he can now ship into market. So blue has three in market. So it's a win-win when you do that kind of thing. Really, really nice um, mechanism. And of course, it also leads something I haven't mentioned is that in this game, there's lots of negotiation, and players may give each other uh, treasury, nothing else but treasury. But you could, for instance, say, "Listen, um, I'm going to ship." Two of your goods, but you've got to pay me one extra, and people can pay with their treasury. You know, there's all these sort of deals that you can do. Really, really nice. Uh, that was the merchant. 
The trader, in a way, is the opposite of the merchant. The trader sells the goods that are in the market um, and adds it to the treasury of the player. Again, um, this is based on your economy level plus any uh, colonies that you own and the number of native power in your colony because these people are not only there to be exploited, they're also a market you can sell to. But it's, it's quite a cynical game. Um, the trader has a similar mechanism where if you had things in the market that you had for sale um, and somebody else had something there too, you could offer to sell these for them, um, in which case they would immediately get the resource and you would get one extra from your pool to reflect the extra thing you've sold. The, um, in this case, it's not so clear cut that you, you'd want to say yes if somebody wants to sell your resource because that means you can't sell it. You know, if, if the, the next player had trader as his next card, then there would be nothing for him to sell. But the trader card also has loans on it, so you could uh, take a, use the card for a loan. So there might be a reason to say yes for that one. Um, that was the trader. I think that's the whole top row now so for some sort of possibly less important or less commonly played things. The missionary. The missionary plays a, a missionary into an area, uh, a mission into an area, and that's quite good because when there is a mission in an area, there cannot be a rebellion, which we'll get to next. The missionary can also take an existing unrest and appease the natives and turn them to Christianity, and they stop being so bloody rebellious. Um, so that's the two things the missionary can do. The rebel is in many ways the opposite of the missionary. The rebel can take away a mission, uh, a mission token, or a rebel can place unrest, or if there's an area where there is unrest and no mission, he can say there's a rebellion. And what you do in that case is you roll um, dice, um, it's the number of unrest tokens times the number of native powers, so in that case three native power, one unrest, so there's three dice, and every hit you get, um, in this case we get one hit, Every hit you get removes one of these uh, horrible European settlers. Of your choice, obviously, you'll remove your um, enemies' tokens if you can. But if you got, if you have many hits, you may have to actually remove your own. In which case, there's a possibility that if all the Europeans are kicked out, that country will become a free country. Um, will kick out all the Europeans. Um, they'll get their own flag, um, and it's a free country from now on. People can still settle there, but it's very hard to turn that into a colony again. Um, and losing a colony loses you a victory point. It's one of the two ways that you can lose a victory point, is to lose a colony. Okay, so that, for those two, the ambassador character is really simple. Where is the ambassador? The ambassador character basically just moves you up on the diplomacy track. In fact, I've just made a mistake. I said it moves you up. Many actions in the game are not specified that you have to move your own token. So you can move somebody else up on the on that uh, track and possibly um, bribe or take, get a bribe to do so. So you can move somebody up on the diplomacy track with the ambassador character, plus you can remove an unrest from the board. You may. You don't have to. You may do that. Um, the sovereign... The sovereign you use to declare war, like I said before, you can only declare war on people at the same or lower level on the diplomacy track. And war is fairly abstracted. If we have, um, as in this case, we have uh, people of two countries in an area, they uh, fight and you roll dice equal to the number of people you have, and every success is a hit, and you remove one of the opponents opposing players pieces. This is done simultaneously. Um, when all land areas has been done, your navies fight against each other in a similar way. You can roll up to five dice in a naval battle. Um, when you score hits in a naval battle and your enemy doesn't have any navies left, you start taking um, casualties from his merchant fleets. So very, very important thing in this game is to keep your naval power up because otherwise you just become a cash cow and when you when you have no navy or a weak navy, everybody attacks you and takes your victory points because that's the other way you can lose a victory point is by losing a war. So if you lose a colony, you lose a victory point. If you lose a war, you lose a victory point. And how you, basically, if red were to lose the war against blue, red would take one of their own uh, prestige points and pass it over to blue who will then get it. So sort of a double whammy swing when you lose a war. The uh, it, 
basically benefits everyone else because the two warring factions are weakened. You play an entire round of war, which is all the land areas where you both are, plus one naval battle. Then the defender has the option to surrender and uh, pay the prestige point to surrender. Or um, if he doesn't, then the attacker can surrender. If he doesn't, they just do the same thing again. Um, if you cannot attack, you must surrender. And it is also possible that both countries at the same time get to a point where they cannot attack, in which case it's a stalemate and things sort of just peter out. But that's, that's pretty rare. Wars are very, very costly, but um, but uh, an effective way to get somebody else to, to lose victory points. The, sorry, now I was going to, just going to talk quickly about when the rebel. Um, the rebel is a good way to get somebody to lose their um, colony. So especially if you have a, a, a sort of a good, a strong leader. I mean, this game people tend to gang up on the leader because the winner is the first guy to have 10 prestige. Should have said that right up front, it's very important. The winner is the first guy to get 10 prestige points and have no debt. If you see somebody's going to get there, people tend to gang up on the leader. Um, and what might happen is two or three of us might put extra um, unrests into an area. And then the next one might trigger the uh, rebellion. So in that case, if it's three unrests times three, that's nine dice. It's a good good chance you're going to kick him out of that area with that, with that many rolls. Um, so lots of opportunity for people to actually collude and work together in this game and possibly exchange bribes to, to help other people achieve their aims. Then the second last character is the governor. The governor character um, is the third way you can earn um, prestige points. So the first one is exploring, the second one is starting a colony. The governor lets you build a thing called a booming city. I had booming city counters here somewhere. Okay, the governor character um, lets you build a booming city, and there they are in the middle of the Atlantic where I didn't see them. Um, booming cities are, there's sort of 10 of them, and they number from 1 to 10. There can only be one on the board at a specific stage. So what you do to, to the governor character can create a booming city by paying the cost um, at least higher, one higher than the previous booming city. So at the beginning of the game, there's no booming city. You pay one, and you place a booming city in an area. Um, what a booming okay booming city immediately gets you a victory point, but it also means that in future, whenever people ship use the merchant character to ship resources, they have to ship from that place first. So if if Red wants to ship four resources, the first two has to come from this area. So the blue guy will actually earn two treasury first up. Every time somebody ships, the blue character is going to get two new resources because they have to ship from these resources first. Um, so remember that system, so if Red wanted to say ship, um, Blue would get paid too, because Red's buying from him, but Red would still add those resources that he got from Blue to the market, because he's now bought them and they're now his. So a um, bit of a um, mental jump you have to make uh, with these resource tokens, because they sort of exchange one for one quite often in the game. Um, you're using your own color, but somebody else is also earning something in their color. So if the next guy wants to earn... Um, build a booming city, he's got to pay two, it has to be, um, he has to have an economy level of at least two to do so, we all start at that level, and basically all that happens is it disappears from here and it appears in the next place. If there's nobody, if nobody's colonized it, nobody gets the points for it, you only get the points for a booming city when you colonize. So if Red were to colonize this later on, they would get a victory point for colonizing, plus another victory point for having the booming city. Um, there is a bit of a converse to that. You know, when we did this, when the booming city was moved from here to there, blue didn't lose anything in that process. However, if you lose a colony, you lose a victory point. If that colony at the time has the booming city, you lose another victory point. So, yeah. It is possible, by the way, if, if, if say, for instance, the red guy was way up here on six um, economy, um, they could buy, spend treasury and buy the number six booming city straight up, which would make it make it really hard for somebody else to take it away from them. So you, you're allowed to do that. Um, that was the, I'm going to see who that was. That was the, the very last card we have is the financier, which allows you to take a loan, which is up to twice the value of your current economy. You add that amount, say for instance, I was there on two beginning. That allows me to take a loan of four. So I'll take it from the pool, add the four to my 
treasury and then add us the same amount to the loan area to show that I have debt of full. Okay, so that those are the actions that you take in the in the endeavor phase, which is like I said, pretty much the entire game. Yeah, thanks very much. That is colonial. Um, really underrated game. I think what happened is when it came out, it was very expensive. Also, the original version had some rules issues, which created some negative buzz around it and um, did this game a disservice because it, it really is an excellent game that uh, probably deserves more than its current uh, position on Board Game Geek. Thank you very much.